Welcome to Movie Life Crisis. Join us as we watch the best movies from 30 years ago. It was the final voyage of America's mightiest battleship. Imagine this arsenal of tactical nuclear weapons falling into the wrong hands. The Pentagon never did. Four minutes ahead of schedule. Damn, I'm good. Now, a team of terrorists have taken over. Wake up the president. But there's just one thing they didn't count on. The cook. Are you like some special forces guy or something? <laughs> no, I'm just a cook. Oh my God, we're going to die. I'm just my a cook. There's an egg seal. <laughs> Expert in martial arts, explosives, Stand back. weapons and tactics. I also cook. Steven Seagal. I know you, don't I? Tommy Lee Jones. It's been a long time. I'll see you in hell, boy. <laughs> Under siege. Oh wow! Under siege. Wow. Wow. Movie Life Crisis, Season 2, Episode 3, Under Siege, the one and only excursion we'll take into the Steven Seagal catalog. You say that now, but somebody's going to donate, and we'll be watching Under Siege 2, Dark Territory. Yeah, I I mean, yeah, we're going to have to put some fine print on our, like, $100 (laughs) donation tier that says, like, no Steven Seagal, because I really don't want to talk about him anymore after this. Anyway, welcome back. I'm JT. You're Jeff. We're your movie life crisis, doing the best movies from 1992, 30 years later. I guess I shouldn't have said best there because we're doing Under Siege. (laughs) There's people that think this is the best. There's people that think this is the best. This is definitely the best Steven Seagal movie. I'll go out and say that. But before we get into it, let's just do some of our housekeeping stuff. We've gotten a couple donations that I want to shout out. First one from frequent donator Nurse Nat, after my cousin Vinny says uh, she loves us two utes. (laughs) And then uh, a first-time donation nice. from from at Like Shine, who says we shouldn't hate on Law and Order. That puts us in a tough position because since Like Shine listens to this podcast, they are clearly a person of impeccable and unimpeachable taste. So if they also <laughs> like procedurals, I don't know what to conclude except that maybe we're wrong and procedurals actually are awesome, uh, but we're not, and they're not. I just can't see, maybe, dude. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. I mean, we'll hit the nursing home and maybe we'll start a podcast about Law and Order in like 35, 40 years. You know how many there'll be? How many episodes they'll have? A Law and Order rewatch pod. I will have to do two episodes a day if there's any chance of getting through it. <laughs> of course. Stay tuned for that 2065 Law and Order rewatch pod. Uh, just a reminder, if you leave a review on Google or on Apple Podcasts, uh, we'll, we'll choose one every week and uh, read it randomly. Although I, I don't know why I say randomly because it's not random. We picked the good ones. <laughs> Unless like last week we had a one that criticized us that we wanted to talk about because we're trying to get better. Right. But this one is five stars, deep dives without the distractions. This show is a refreshing listening experience free of the manic diatribes, constant interruptions, and unbalanced audio levels unfortunately prevalent in this modern podcast age. It's a smooth, intelligent, and insightful discussion about film between two friends with an obvious history, easy rapport, and a shared love and appreciation for the art form. This is everything you want from a conversation dissecting the nuances of the movie experiences that shape your lives. Holy hell, that's a phenomenal review. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to put that on my book cover when we write a book about making podcasts. Put that on your freaking tombstone. Get that (laughs) engraved in there. That's really nice. Who did, who did that? Does it have a name? It didn't have a name. It was That's an Apple podcast review, so it has just their Apple username, which is just like kind of nonsensical, so I didn't include it. Cool. But yeah, that's a great review. Thank you so much. And if anyone else wants to leave a good review and have a chance at hearing it read on the show, feel free to do that on Google or Apple. And on Spotify, you can just click five stars, or you can send us an email or follow us on social media. So, okay, Under Siege. Let's do Name That Tune first. I can't. I, let's, I, oh, man, I keep forgetting about Name That Tune. I keep telling myself I'm going to psych myself up for it. All right, 1992. Name that tune. Here we go. Oh, no. This is uh, Shake That Body by, uh, no, I got nothing. Uh, Power by Snap. I don't know. What is it? <laughs> You're so close. It's it's Move It by Technotronic. Move It! But Shake That Body is the whole chorus. That's Shake That Body. That's why I thought Shake that. Shake That Body. Wow. If you could make it smell like puke in here and get a couple of degrees hotter, I would just feel like I was on the Gravitron. (laughs) So Technotronic, this song is number 38 on the year. Their biggest song by far was last year, Pump Up the Jam. 
pump up the jam. Yeah, yeah, that's Technotron. Okay, I got it. Uh, it's locked in. I'll never forget it from here on out. I recognize the song, but man, I'm, I'm mad that I didn't know who sang it or what the name of it was. It's exactly what I wanted out of Name That Tune is a song that you go like, ah, I know that and I can't think of the name of it. Man, the hardest part about Name That Tune, honestly, is that I, I go listen to these songs and then they get stuck in my head and I want to call you and talk about them, but I can't because I haven't played them yet on the podcast. <laughs> yes. And it's killing me because I'll shuffle through stuff and I'm like, I think this song's from 1992. Let me check. Oh, can't listen to this. Next. Can't listen to that. All right. Name that tune. Jeff is uh, is two for three on the year. Oh, man. Under Siege, why this movie was chosen, I, I honestly, I, I don't know. Because it was good in my brain. I had a real Steven Seagal, Jean-Claude Van Damme phase as a like 11, 12 year old, right? Right when these movies were coming out, I watched all of them, even the bad ones, which is all of them, basically. My brother and I were taking karate. Like I was like running with my hands flat like Steven Skull was, so I had less wind resistance. Yeah, that's why he does that. (laughs) (laughs) He runs like an idiot. Yeah, he went to the Tom Cruise running school. But anyway, but I knew that there was no other movie in Steven Seagal's catalog that there, we could possibly watch because they're all so, 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 so bad. But this one I thought would be maybe okay. And honestly, it was maybe okay. Yeah, all right. I believe you. All right. Give us a synopsis. So you want the long one or the short no. one? I'm just joking. Okay. Uh, an ex-Navy SEAL turned cook is the only person who can stop a group of terrorists when they seize control of a U.S. battleship. I mean, are we sure they're terrorists? Are we sure they're not freedom fighters? Tommy Lee Jones, it seemed like he was on the side of right in this one. He had a tie-dye t-shirt on. He was part of the revolution. Yeah, the revolution. See, not a movement, because movement stops. Movement stops. Revolution keeps going round and round. That was some of the great dialogue from this movie. Great writing. We'll get to the writer. But I have stuff about him. This guy wrote Pretty Woman. This guy is a legitimately, like, very... Uh, very decorated screenwriter. I saw some of the stuff he did and I was like, really? Shocking. $35 million budget. This movie grossed $156 million. That's because Steven Seagal and his stupid ponytail were popular back then. They were popular back then. And he didn't have a ponytail in this movie because the Navy would not allow you to have a ponytail. So he had to have, he had long hair, not the quote unquote trademark ponytail. You know what he did have though that I don't think the Navy allows? A tiny little belly. When he took his jacket off and he was just wearing that green wife beater, I was like, Steven Seagal is kind of pudgy. I love to have an action hero that's like not in good shape. That makes me feel really good to see that on screen. It's like, hey, that's my people right there. Not that <laughs> Steven Seagal is my people, but fat people is my people. Uh, Steven Seagal would think he's your people. The, I was going to say, that's the meanest thing you've ever said to me, that Steven Seagal would think he's my people. <laughs> he thinks he's everybody's people. $156 million gross. This is the biggest movie of the fall of 1992. That's crazy. I mean, we're talking about a fall that included stuff like A Few Good Men, Aladdin. It's, it's ludicrous. This movie did as much money as it did. Awards? Did you find any awards? So this was the only Seagal movie that received an Academy Award nomination. Uh, there two was two nominations, yeah. Best Sound Effects and uh, Best Sound. Uh, it didn't win either category, though. It, thankfully, it did not win. We don't have to say, like, Academy Award winner Steven Seagal. You know, he didn't. But you, you should say we are watching Academy Award nominated Under Siege. An Under Siege Academy Award nominated movie. Actually, the sound was really good in this movie. Yeah, it was. Anyway, sequel spinoffs, Under Siege 2 in 1995, which we're definitely not doing. I don't care. Put your wallets away. There's no amount of money. <laughs> we're going to update our $100 <laughs> rewards tier to say no Steven Seagal. No Steven Seagal. That's... We're going to have to because I can't. I can't I can't go back. It, reading about Steven Seagal makes me, feel, makes me feel bad. Makes me feel weird. By the way, sorry, apologies to all women. Apologies for this movie because it's terrible and it's extremely not female friendly. Your wife and my wife both will attest to that. Uh, she definitely would. She was couldn't believe she was still watching it by the time we got to the end. Yeah, this movie is a big fail on the uh, Bechdel test. Do you know what the Bechdel test is? I do not. What is that? It's a measure of representation of women in works of fiction that was made up by like a female cartoonist like in the 80s. But to pass the test, the movie has to have two women speak to one another about a topic that isn't a man. Huh. So like women have to have a conversation that's not about a man for for a work to pass the Bechdel test. This is a big fail. Yeah. Was there only the one woman in it? I'm thinking now. There was only the one woman. And not only does she not speak to another woman, but she pops out of a cake naked. Feminism, not not real, not real strong in this movie. Part of the reason I remember trying to watch it, though. Dude, absolutely. 100% the same. Uh, I do want to say, like, there's a bunch of other tests like this that are about minorities and sexual orientation and stuff like that. That's actually kind of a fun wormhole to go down. 
whatever the test is about black representations. Like, you know, you have to have a black character in the movie who talks to another black character about something that's not racially motivated. Yeah. They have to have a conversation that isn't about race. I could see a lot of movies not passing that. Or like you have to have gay characters that their character didn't need to be gay. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, hey, it's a buddy comedy, but one of the people's gay. Not like, right. oh, well, there's the token gay guy who has a gay problem that we have to solve. It's like, no, he's just <laughs> in the movie, but also he's gay. A gay problem. What would be a gay problem again? I don't know. What's the freaking <laughs> movie with um, Oliver Platt and um, Matthew Perry? <laughs> Click, 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 click. Yeah, when he's clicking the pen to tell him to stop. Three to tango. Three to tango. Like that movie would fail that whatever that gay test is that we'll have to look up when that movie comes around. Cool. What's next? Do you remember when and where you first saw this movie? I don't. Uh, So this is the thing. Uh, I did talk to Will and he said he feels like this is a movie we watched at one of his sleepovers, but I don't really vividly remember. All I do remember is July 89 jumping out of the cake and her boobs. And I remember that part because I was young enough to still, this was before you could find boobs all over everywhere. That's I can remember as a young person being excited for that. I, I did read something too that uh, video rental shops had to keep replacing the VHS tape because that part was continually <laughs> worn out from being rewound and replayed by people. That's amazing. I don't think, I mean, I don't know that kids today are going to fully understand what the availability of like boobs are today compared to when we grew up. Dude, I talk to my students about this all the time. I was like, guys, the the internet is full of porn yeah. and it has other stuff too, I'm assuming. You guys can find it whenever you want and you have an unhealthy relationship with it and you think that's what it's like uh, and it's nothing like that in real life. Uh, so I don't want you to think there's a false sense of uh, that's how it's going to be. And they'll never know the plight of like watching it late at night with your thumb on the channel up button so or the jump button to go back to MTV in case somebody came down the hall. Like they don't know any of that. They don't have to worry about any of that. They just watch it on their screen, on their phone, in their bed, late at night by themselves. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like not even like, you know, like when we were kids, it's like, oh, hey, maybe there's a Victoria's Secret catalog around. Maybe Cinemax is going to come in like 30% clear. Or it's like green tinted, but like this, it might hold stable at the right level and might, might check out a little bit of that. Or like, or like, oh, oh, dad rented me uh, Under Siege. Great. I'm going to watch that one part a thousand times before I turn the tape in. Right. Like we're, or like Total Recall. It's like, oh, not, there's an extra boob in this one. I don't watch this. She's got three boobs. Bonus boob. Everybody likes bonus boobs. We might have watched that at Will's party. I don't remember that specifically. I watched all the Seagal movies like on VHS in my house. I just rented them like over and over again. Like I'd be like, oh, I'll watch uh, Out for Justice again. I haven't seen that in a few weeks. He's going to snap the guy's arm over his shoulder. It's going to be great. I do remember, I've spent the night on this ship. What? The Missouri or the Al- Alabama? The USS Missouri in this movie is being played by the USS Alabama, which is actually yeah. like is parked in Mobile, Alabama and is a museum. And when I was in Cub Scouts around this time, we went and like spent the night there. Oh, that's cool. I've been there, but I've never done that. Yeah. So that's what I was trying to think. I don't think it's a school trip. I think it was a Cub Scout thing because we spent the night. That's pretty cool. And I don't know that, I didn't know at the time that this, because there wasn't the internet then, I didn't know that this was the boat that was in the movie. Right. But now I know it was the boat that was in the movie. Did you see how they did it too? They had like a barge with like a big black curtain to block out the lights in the background. Oh, nice. So there was like a barge that moved around. And that's why when they show some of the water scenes, it doesn't look like the water's like really rough or moving. Yeah, because it's it's in Mobile Bay. Yeah, it's just in the bay uh, in Mobile, uh, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Uh, how many chimmy dogs you got for this one? Dude, I didn't want to... I'm trying not to really crap on it too much. Yeah. Because so many people like it, but I'm going to give it three chimmy dogs out of 10. I got five. I got five, five out of 10. I mean, the thing is, man, it's not a terrible movie. It, the plot is fine. The performances are fine. Seagal is as good as he's ever going to be. The problem for me is that it's really corny 30 years later. And, and also, in addition to that, I know that Steven Seagal is one of the worst human beings in all of the recorded history. And so that makes me yeah, he's pretty bad. not want to watch his movie. Even when I'm going like, he's actually decent in this movie. I'm going like, but he's such a f***ing terrible human being. Yeah, he's bad. When we get to the worst, which is going to be way longer than the best for this one, I think, I'll read just some of the court cases that have been leveled against him in the last 30 years. IMDb had it at six and a half. Rotten Tomatoes is 79%. Everybody, I, people like this movie, man. But I, dude, uh, I'm still, I'm sticking with my three, three chimmy dogs. That's all he's getting. That's yeah. that's not even an entree. No, it's barely a snack. Yeah, that's that's a half of an appetizer. So the uh, the other thing is that the podcast has been on a roll. Every every movie episode that we've done since Robin Hood, which is like last September, yeah, has been has done better than the one before it. That streak ends here. It's been a good run. 
maybe people will listen and maybe people like this movie and I don't want to tell them that they like it and I, it wasn't even really like the misogyny or it wasn't the um, not political correctness. It was just like, to me, I just didn't understand. Freaking great value Nick Nolte was dressed like a woman. Well, why did he even do that? Like, why was that in the movie? Yeah, but let's not get out of order though. Let's do the best. Like, let's... You go first. Best scene. Wait, do you want some, do you want the Steven Seagal facts first? Do you want the, uh... Sure. Give me some Steven Seagal facts. These are totally true facts that I definitely didn't make up. I'm just going to read them out for you. So Seagal is not his real last name. It's his stage name. Uh, He picked it because it reminded him of his favorite animal, the seagull, which attacks strangers for scraps of food. Awesome. Seagal actually holds three black belts and a keto, which is perfect because once he has them sewn together end to end, he can still wear them. (laughs) (laughs) Seagal claims to be one quarter Cherokee, by which he means he weighs as much as one quarter of a Jeep Cherokee. (laughs) A Mitsubishi Montero. (laughs) Uh, Seagal came out last year as trans. He says his body's at least 70% trans fats, and he stands with the community. Oh, man. Seagal took a knee with Colin Kaepernick a couple years ago. A lot of people don't know this. Well, not so much with him, but at the same time, he's winded from walking to get a hoagie. (laughs) Seagal gained 40 pounds for his role in Under Siege. Uh, No one asked him to do that. (laughs) He loves to tell war stories about him and his old Navy buddies, the people that he worked with at Old Navy. Oh, man. Uh, When he was first starting out, he turned down a role on a soap opera because he didn't want anyone to think that he used soap. (laughs) Um, He's also a professional UFC fighter. No, wait, sorry, I misspoke. A KFC fighter. And he's a veteran of the Navy SEALs. No, sorry, again, the Gravy SEALs, uh, Meal Team 6. Meal Team Six. So those are some Seagal facts that I collected for for everyone. I'm sad you didn't make fun of his (laughs) yellow glasses. I didn't have three scenes. I just wrote down three things that I remembered that weren't terrible. Yeah, what you got? What's your first one? The first one was when the microwave blows up. He pours some like liquids together and he sticks them in the microwave and he turns the timer on. And then later on, Tommy Lee Jones and Great Value Nick Nolte came down and the whole thing blew up. A long time though. He it was in the microwave for like. 10 movie minutes, so who knows how long that was. Yeah, it was a really long time. Uh, My first best scene was the opening scene with George Bush giving a speech because that was actual George Bush giving the actual speech for the decommission. Yeah, for decommissioning the Missouri. They actually showed up with their camera crew and recorded the same thing and used it in the movie. And I thought that was cool because they mixed a little bit of history in there. History is in, I'm never going to watch it again. (laughs) What's your next best? Um, I had Tommy Lee Jones when he was like talking about the revolution and then he's like using a hunting knife to like cut off hunks of turkey and he was like just eating them with his bare hands. Yeah, what was that? Why? I don't know. It was They were like weird. throwing like slabs of meat around and they, they were, were throwing like eating it. They were throwing slabs of meat to him and he would catch it with his bare hands and like rip off a hunk. Yeah, I didn't get but that. But then they were drinking champagne at the same time. The whole it was bizarre. I don't Yeah. They were throwing it on like the light up table that they were using to look at the blueprints of the ship and plan stuff out. And there's like <laughs> yeah. a big like meat chunk yeah, right on top. A, it, yeah, it was meat platter. And then when he got mad, he, th- he stuck his knife in the table and walked off. And I was like, that wasn't a wooden table. Where did he just <laughs> stick his knife in? <laughs> Maybe he stuck it in the meat. Yeah, I think that's what happened. What's your next one? My next best scene was uh, when I saw the movie's poster on Plex and I was pulling it up and getting ready to watch it. I like that part because I still had hope. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that it was when you saw the movie's credits begin to roll because then you were done. No, that's my last best scene is the credits. <laughs> the third one I have is when they blow up the submarine uh, with the like World War II uh, gun. I had problems with that. It was like Battleship. Yeah, there's a lot of problems with that. Why is the World War II gun still working? And why is there a World War II veteran on the boat who still knows how to use it? But even though there's a World War II veteran on the boat, Seagal's the one like looking through the portal going like, yeah, get two degrees up at 217. Yeah. Like, shouldn't the guy who n- used this gun in World War II be that guy? He was telling him stuff. He was like, tamp that powder light. And then Seagal would repeat exactly, yeah, tamp that powder light. <laughs> like, he would like repeat it. And then when it exploded... And then there was like another explosion that went off also. So I got to see two explosions when they blew it up. Yeah, they probably taped a grenade to it before the show went out. <laughs> Is that when he was swimming in the side stroke <laughs> with his freaking mask on on top of the water so everybody could see him? <laughs> Navy SEAL, get out of here. Yeah, he was a Navy SEAL. He was just freaking, I mean, he had ballast with him because his belly was keeping him afloat, but he didn't, he didn't ever <laughs> dove. He swam above the water where everyone could see him. The whole time, just. And then and they started shooting at him and throwing grappling hooks at him, and he still never submerged. He just, just kept swimming on top of the water. 
let's not take it take too close a look at that. What's your best quote? Uh, there's one where uh, July eighty nine. She says, "I hate being alone," and Seagal says, "Do you hate being dead?" <laughs> <laughs> so I really, <laughs> I really like that one because it sucks really bad. <laughs> <laughs> she pops out of the cake because she took too many Ambien or whatever, and she missed that everyone was like, everyone got hostage, hostages. And then she pops out in the empty room and she freaking showing her boobs off. And Steven Seagal's like got his machine gun and his tank top and his belly. Yeah. And he's going to lock her in a locker. I don't know why she could just stayed in the room. But then when he puts her in the locker, she's like banging and screaming. It's like, dude, you understand that there's like 40 yeah. terrorists on this ship? You can't throw a tantrum right now. If he wants to lock you in a locker, just be glad you don't have to hang out with Steven Seagal. <laughs> yeah. Be glad he's not sexually assaulting you. Why couldn't she just hang out in the room and then get in the locker if she heard someone coming? I mean, yeah, I don't, that, that would have been a perfect solution. Like he, he, the door locks. It has like the little handle that you move where no one can get in through the hatch. Right. Like just, just dude, just sit here, lock the hatch, take a nap. And if you see somebody, become the hatch. What did that mean? I don't know. I don't know. This He was killing me. What's your first quote? Great. I only have one. I got it. I'm going to play it for you. It's when Seagal's trying to get the other people to come help him, like, take back over the ship. Oh, yeah. what? I do laundry. I was ironed during the Gulf War. I ain't cut out for this hero bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. That was my favorite line of the movie by far. I was ironing during the Gulf War. I ain't cut out for this hero bullshit. Because that's exactly what, if Jeff had been in this movie, that would have been exactly how it would have gone down. <laughs> I would have still been in the kitchen cooking <laughs> with the cooks. Which leads me to my next quote. When the guy that's, watch, that's watching him, he's like, you got a fire in here. And he's like, get my pies out the oven. Why, why is that even in there? Like, I, I just don't, it, they didn't go back to it, use the smoke as some sort of, he could hide in the smoke from the pot. Like, that didn't need to be in there. I don't get it. First of all, he's cooking for an entire fucking boat. He made two pies. <laughs> he did have 50 gallons of bouillabaisse, though. Yeah, 50 gallons of bouillabaisse and two pies. I'm not coming to dinner. F*** that. And then second of all, the Navy ships don't cook on propane or on gas because obviously if you have a boat and people shoot at it and you have propane or gas, it blows up. So everything, all the kitchen appliances are it's electric. electric. Yeah, I figured that. The other thing that I had written down was when uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Great Value Nick Nolte were talking and he said, oh, these things are going to sell like hotcakes. He's like, what are you going to do with your $200 million in the bank? Great Value Nick Nolte says, buy the presidency. I can't imagine $200 million is enough to buy the presidency. No, I don't think so. Because Ross Perot tried in uh, 92 and he had way more money than that and it didn't work. Uh, I don't think you can buy the presidency for $200 million. And I don't like great value Nick Nolte in this movie, so I wanted to mention how bad he was. I don't either. And, and I know that he's not bad, so I just feel like that this part was really poorly written or was really poorly directed because everybody was being so – like I told Wendy – this movie is like a live action Archer episode. All of the shit that's <laughs> happening is so stupid and so extra. Oh, that's perfect. Yes. Live action Archer. That's what it is. That's the only way that it makes sense is it's like, if this was a cartoon, it would make sense. But for real humans, it doesn't make sense. Like Hudson Hawk is more, is more real than this. I watched Hudson Hawk last week, by the way. Nice. Do you think we can get H. John Benjamin to just do like a, a voiceover of all Steven Seagal's lines <laughs> in Archer's voice? Oh, dude, that would be great. I wonder if you could just take all of the film from this movie and just animate Archer over the top of Steven Seagal and then revoice it too. Could just because they're rebooting this. HBO Max is rebooting this right now. Can't we just take the original rebooting film what? Just, they're rebooting Under Siege. Warner Brothers and HBO Max are rebooting this movie right now. Oh man! But let's just take the original movie and just draw Archer over Steven Seagal and then just yeah. call it good. That'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be great. I don't have any other quotes. I just got that one. No, that's that's plenty. Characters, I only have one. I got Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, that's who I, I, I just Tommy Lee Jones. He's great, dude. He's so over the top, but the whole movie's so over the top. It's actually a good character choice for him to be over the top because the whole freaking thing is over the top. Yeah, I, I really liked um, how crazy he was. Dude, he was super. Do you know how old he was in this movie? I thought he was 60. He was 46 <laughs> in this movie. He looks like a catcher's mitt that was left out in the rain for like a few years. But he was 46. <laughs> I think he's always looked like that. He has always looked like that. <laughs> but I was like, man, Tommy Lee Jones in good shape. And then I looked it up. It's like, oh, he's 46. No wonder. Uh, I'm 43. I got three more years to get in Tommy Lee Jones shape is what you're telling me. <laughs> Dude, I couldn't even get in Steven Seagal's shape in that amount of time. <laughs> That's just, I have to like. I need to do, I need to start doing some sit-ups and I need to uh, let my face in the sun for hours at a time. <laughs> 
<laughs> and leave your face out on the back porch for a couple of years for that Tommy Lee Jones look. Yeah, he that was the only he's the only character I have. Me too. I really like. I love Great Value Nick Nolte. He was terrible in this. Horrible. I will talk about it when we get to the worst. Um, I got some other some other good stuff. The writer J F Lawton. Yeah. This guy wrote Pretty Woman. He wrote Blank Man. I wasn't talking to my jammy. I wasn't talking to my jammy. And he wrote Under Siege 2. So he's got some highs and lows. And he did Chain Reaction, which was also a low. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote this as a spec script, which means no one hired him to write it. He just wrote it in his free time, and then he sold it for a million dollars. It's pretty nice, right? I mean, after Pretty Woman, I think he probably had a lot of people wondering what he was working on next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the director, Andrew Davis, um, he co-wrote and directed Above the Law, which was Seagal's first film. Yeah, and then he came on to do this movie. And from this movie, he, he worked with Tommy Lee Jones. And then he went from there to do uh, Fugitive. The Fugitive, yeah. Did you read the thing about how Tommy Lee Jones was like, uh, between takes or like during the filming of this, he read rough draft of the script for Fugitive. And he's like, yeah, I want in. I want to do that. Nice. And I'm glad he did because like that's... I can't wait to do that movie. No, I think that's next year, 93. Nice. When's Chain Reaction? Are we doing that? Keanu Reeves and Morgan Freeman. Dude, I'm, I'm down for Chain Reaction. I think that'd be great. He also did Collateral Damage and Holes. Yeah, Collateral Damage. Like this guy, the, the director's, but so the point is like the director's done a bunch of pretty good stuff. The writer's done a bunch of pretty good stuff. Um, and that's why this is almost pretty good. <laughs> if we could just put Archer over Steven Seagal. Dude, I just have to imagine that it's just Steven Seagal Every time someone has a good idea, he has a bunch of really loud, really bad ideas, and you just end up having to do it his way. He seems to me like the people I know that are confidently incorrect, just yeah. always they know the answer, but it's not really the right answer. But it could be if you said it the right way, it would sound like it would be. That's how he is. Well, I mean, he was on like Fox News last year saying that Putin is like a really great guy. So, yeah, confidently incorrect is certainly a, like an accurate description. That's the end of the good. I have some random, not good, not bad. Um, the I had that the sound was actually was good, like the sound effects, not the score, but the sound happening in the movie. I actually saw that. I saw that those were the awards they were up for before I watched it, and I kind of paid attention to that, and it was good. Yeah, the only Steven Skull movie to ever generate any Oscar nominations. And then the other is that Erica Aliniak was Jordan Tate, who's Miss July 89, who's the playmate who jumps naked out of the cake. In real life, she was actually the playmate, Miss July 89. Yeah, yeah. Did you know that the Playboy that they hold up in that part of the movie where he's showing it to Stonehands, that's the same issue of Playboy that they show in Home Alone in Buzz's bedroom or whatever, you, wherever he was, which is cool, right? Yeah, that's awesome. That's the kind of stuff people need from us. Which also had Daniel Stern in it. And Daniel Stern was in Rookie of the Year with Great Value Nick Nolte. Three moves. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, I don't think we survived that crash. <laughs> Uh, dude, I was so happy when I saw Stonehands in this. It's like Stonehands still still working. I just yelled it. I just said, "Don't throw it to Stonehands." Man, I feel pretty bad for Dwayne Davis going from Necessary Roughness to this movie. I mean, I guess they're both big movies, but at some point, as he just asked his agent, "Like, do you have anything good? Can you send me anything good?" Yeah. Can I read for something good? No, he can't apparently because I don't remember him in anything else besides this, the program, and uh, Necessary Roughness. Yeah. At least this wasn't a football movie. He was able to he was able to round out his uh He's branching out. Also, did you know that this pushed back a uh, Die Hard, the third Die Hard movie? The the spec script for Die Hard uh was a, about a cruise ship that was being taken over by terrorists and they said, uh, this is too close to under siege, so let's just rewrite it and it came up with uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance. Nice. Which uh, is the best Die Hard as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I like that one. I definitely like it better than two. I don't know about whether than the original. R than the original. Dude, Sam Jackson and friggin' um, the other guy, the bad guy, Scar. He was awesome. Jeremy Irons. Jeremy Irons. There you go. Yeah, he killed it. Take that guy who thought we didn't know about movies. <laughs> suck on that. Pull that one right out of my brain. Didn't even go on the internet. Yeah, I read a Vice article about how bad this movie was, and the and the guy in the article was just, he wasn't calling it Under Siege. He was calling it Die Hard on a Boat where Erica Aleniak jumps naked out of a cake. And he would put that in quotes. Every time he referenced the name of the movie, he would just say that again. Oh, that's great. <laughs> All right, that's the end of the good for me. And we stretched it about as long as we can. You got anything? No more good. Let's go to the worst. Yeah, we don't even have a fake ad read because we just want to get out of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Worst. What's your first worst? I got Seagal karate chops a guy in the neck and then kills him, I guess, somehow. Like, the guy was, like, laying on the ground. And he just does, like a, like, a small chop. I don't think that you could break, like, a baguette with that chop, but I guess that killed the guy. I thought it just knocked him out. 
where he like spun and flipped him over and then trapped him in the neck. Okay, so that the side of the neck, like the Vulcan, the Vulcan neck pinch, but like hit him in the I don't know. And then another time he like he like did the roadhouse thing where he like yeah. rips the guy's larynx out. And then that guy fell down dead too. And that was confused by that because it seemed like that happened really fast for him to have starved to death in that time. <laughs> you can live without that, can't you? Yes, of course you can. You just can't yell, but you could still like keep swinging, but he just fell down dead. He Steven Seagal ripped Can you can you also get one of those like vape pens that you hold up to your throat and it's, would you like to play a game? Like is that those people? I would think. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't like how he roadhoused uh, that guy. That sucked. Uh, all right, so my first worst scene is uh, Seagal is uh, dancing and talking to the kitchen crew, uh, and he's using this Cajun accent, and I didn't like it at all. I didn't either, and it, I was trying to be I was trying to be objective about it because I don't like it because I can tell that Seagal thinks that he's really cool, and I think he's really not cool. So I was trying to like not filter it through that lens. Me too. But I just think even if I didn't know that he was one of the douchiest douches who ever douched, that I still <laughs> wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> uh, same. I didn't like it at all. I didn't like his Cajun accent. I didn't like how he was like uh, giving him bones. Like giving him I didn't a pound. Li- yeah, didn't, I didn't like that. Uh, and then the other thing is, is people were just like walking in and out of the kitchen. Like, I, yeah. I don't know what I pictured a battleship being like, but I thought everybody had like the stations they were supposed to be at and nobody like loitered around the ship with a boom box and freaking danced with Steven Seagal in the kitchen. I thought it was more regimented than that. I don't know either. You, you and I know the same amount about the Navy, which is <laughs> pass. <laughs> No, thank you. Don't want to tuck my shirt in. Don't want to get up early. <laughs> the, no push-ups for me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to do the cadence push-ups where after four, it's like, okay, my punishment's through. I can't do any more than that. Next, Next stop, we drop. drop. Dude, I didn't, even tr- I didn't even try to keep track of scenes because I just, th- I mean, it was all of them. Yeah, so what's your next one? Did you have another one? I just was listing bat- things that I didn't like. This is the era where the gunfights all had cheats enabled. No one ever ran out of ammo. Like, Seagal had like... Ever, ever. Dude, he, he had one machine gun and he would just do like, he would do like, he's like... And then he would run down the hallway and do like, <laughs> and he would go like three more hallways. And I'm like, dude, what's the, he never changed magazines. He had one time where he was running with two machine guns crossed across his body, shooting in hatches on either side of him. Dude, that's all metal, by the way. Don't do that. Yeah. Those freaking bullets are going everywhere, but no one ever ran out of ammo. Yeah, there was uh, something I was reading, and they were on a boat, on a battleship like that, and they have the shotguns are like the most popular thing on the boat. I don't know if that's true, but like yeah. they shoot them off the ground. Yeah. So like, because it's metal and it pops up and hits the people, so they they like come around the corner and shoot off the ground and it bounces up and hits them in the body. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I would think that that was really realistic. Meanwhile, he was just running down the hall, shooting the <laughs> walls. And uh, I mean, like continuing on that, like everybody had infinite ammo and just shot bullets every f- which way like it wasn't a thing like the boat wasn't like they weren't in a metal tube right but everyone in this movie was holding guns like they're not real guns like great value nick nolte was like holding his gun on his face tapping himself like right <laughs> next to the eye with his loaded pistol and like <laughs> like tommy lee jones had his like pointed up at his head and i was like did you and like fingers on the trigger that's terrible did you see i'm sure you saw the part where seagal puts his thumb in the trigger guard to check to see if there's a bullet in the chamber and rather <laughs> puts his thumb in the trigger guard and then pulls the <laughs> The gun back with his index finger and looks in it. What are you? What are you doing? There's some great montages on the internet of Seagal being really stupid with guns, even though he's working with different gun companies to produce Steven Seagal branded weapons because he of thinks he's an expert at all of it. But like, of course. You can just, there's one clip from like one of his direct to video movies he's released in the last five years as a way to launder money for the Russian mafia. <laughs> it's like he's holding a rifle like he's right handed. And then at some point he just like turns to the left and he just switches hands and holds it by the other hand. It's awful. Seagal to me was he's really good at martial arts and there was no like fighting and there's no like hand-to-hand combat like at the very end he was like slapping people i don't know enough about martial arts the whole thing i was like i didn't think this is what this was i i remembered it being more fighting fighting the only true thing about steven seagal the only thing that's not total and utter horse shit is that he actually is like an aikido black belt and has been since he was a teenager that's the only thing about him that's not made up and there wasn't even any fighting in this movie really but if you look up him doing a demonstration of Aikido, it's literally just like seven guys that just keep running at him and he just grabs their hand and flips them over, grabs their hand, flips them over, grabs this guy's hand and kicks kicks him in the ass, grabs this guy's hand, flips him over. And they're just like falling over right away, getting back up and running right back at him. If that's what Aikido is, I, I feel confident that I could probably be yellow 
maybe a chartreuse belt. I'm just basing it on the ribbons I used to get in swim team. Where it's like, <laughs> congratulations, Jeff. 15th yeah. place. Here's a brown ribbon. Yeah, 13th place. Here's a magenta <laughs> ribbon for you. No, the Aikido demonstrations, they look like complete bullshit. Like a guy runs at Seagal and he takes one hand and like taps him and the guy like hurls himself and does a front flip. And it's yeah. like, Master Steven Seagal, you can't teach that. It's like the guy just ran and fell down. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that. But at, at some point before he got into Hollywood, he was a legitimate like Aikido black belt in Japan. And I think everything we've ever seen on film is total bullshit. This movie, The Fighting, was bad. It was like unlimited ammo and like roadhouse to guy's throat and then he's freaking bandsaw the guy he bandsaw the guy the knife fights looked like they were just slapping each other like when we used to like slap fight each other in high school or you just like slap with both hands as fast as you can until you get tired <laughs> and you go eat pizza <laughs> that's what the fights looked like yeah i remember that uh all right my second scene uh they shoot down the sub everybody's super excited <laughs> They're high-fiving. People are freaking hugging. Everything's going great. And the girl runs over to him, and I thought it was going to be a kiss. Yeah. And instead, her face is buried into his belly, and he's rubbing the side of her ears like he's petting a dog. (laughs) My wife made me rewind that twice because she was like, there's no way that's what he just did. He totally just did that, and I hated it. So now it's like a thing. Cat's like sitting on the couch and I'll walk behind her and rub her ears. I'm like, hey, we sunk the sub. She's like, get the hell away from me. Stop touching me. Yeah, that's an excellent choice. By the way, right before that, they're walking on the deck of the ship and they're just talking. There's no cover. They just got finished killing a bunch of terrorists, but they're just standing out in the open. And when they're talking about the guns and he's like, gunny, I'm like, why is he pausing so long? Those guns we still have bullets for. Like everything was slow and stupid and out in the open. And I thought they would have not done it that way. It ended up with him rubbing her ears. And that's the part I hated. <laughs> yeah, they, they they made the plan to like shoot at the sub and it was like Seagal and his like little crew and Miss July 89. And they literally just had this like really long, this really long planning session. Yeah, in World War II, Gunny, on the deck of the Missouri. All the terrorists, except for the ones that Seagal's taken out, are still alive and everyone on the nuclear sub is still there. And they're just like... Let's just freaking, let's just go up on deck and chat about this for a while. We don't have any five millimeter bullets, but you know what we do have? Bad acting? I don't know. This is, I can't. I was having trouble making it through. I know I can't turn it off because we decided to do this movie, but I didn't want to. What did, did you have anything else? Because I have one more that I want to mention. Dude, I have a bunch more. I, I mean, like, I don't know. I could have organized this better, but I was just listing bad stuff as I was going through the movie. How many people came in? How many bad guys came in on the chopper? How many people does a chopper hold? Because Seagal killed like 25 people before the last act of the movie started. Wendy was like, how many terrorists could there be left? And I was like in my mind counting it up. I was like, yeah, he's got like 18 people that he's already killed. How how full was the chopper? Plus, wouldn't they have to have all their guns on there? Wouldn't they have to well, have yeah. the band stuff on there? All the band stuff on there and like all the waiters, everybody came over on that? Like They all came on the one helicopter? I don't know. I, guess, I mean, I guess the, the whole front of the movie was like Great Value Nick Nolte was going to go behind the captain's back to like make sure the chopper could land. But it was, was it two choppers? I don't know. But I think it was, it, the whole I thing was, was like one. he's going to get one chopper to land and everything came on the one chopper. So it's like a freaking clown car helicopter because Seagal kept killing terrorists and there kept being plenty of terrorists left. So at the very end, uh, everybody's on the deck and they're partying, acting like they weren't about to die a half hour before that. Uh, a guy comes up to me, a guy comes up to him and says, um, uh, it's the cue ball guy. And he was like, yo, Casey, show me some moves. And he goes, I'll show you a move. And he just turns around and kisses her. That was horrible. It was really bad. It I was a bad it. kiss. I, he didn't ask for her permission. There was no consent there. I hated that anyone had to kiss Steven Seagal, and he did it in front of like 35 people. It was, you know what it reminded me of? The Michael Jackson kiss on Remember the Time. Remember how awkward that was <laughs> D- during the bridge when he's like, mm. yeah. And he goes to kiss her, and his face like slams into her. Uh, that's what it reminded me of. I was like, what is he? Why is he? I hated that scene. And then right before that, it was like, yo, Casey was for breakfast. And then like one of the other guys is like, subs. <laughs> Everyone's like cackling and slapping each other. and That's going to need about four stitches. <laughs> I hate needles, Doc. <laughs> this guy wrote Pretty Woman. Are we sure? Yes, he definitely did. But dude, I wonder how much of this Seagal like forces people to put in. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's a, I found some real life Steven Seagal quotes. When he did The Glimmer Man, he does it in a couple of years with Keenan Ivory Wayans. Yeah. He says in an interview about The Glimmer Man that he's like, Keenan and I talked about it on the set of the movie every day about who's funnier and I kicked his ass. Like, Seagal thinks that he's funnier than Keenan Ivory Wayans. He's not funnier than any of the Wayans, even the ones we don't know. 
No. Do, do you know that he was the one that said they should put July 89 in there? He's like, maybe we should have a woman follow me around. I think that would add some humor to the film. I was like, that freaking failed miserably. That wasn't funny at all. That's what I'm saying. I'm just going to assume that all the bad stuff about this movie came from Seagal. Like all the stupid quips and the one lines and the like really awkward ear rubbing and the like forced kisses in front of a bunch of people. Yeah, I'll go with that. Um, I talked about the last scene. I mean, the last like the climatic knife fight between him and Tommy Lee Jones just looked like a slap fight. Like that was dumb. Way bad. And if all the guns never run out of bullets, why do we have to use knives? And you hold it where it aims down your forearm. Yeah, he holds it with the like blade pointing down. And then earlier when- It It looks cool. It looks cool. But in the room where he was like killing the guy with the bandsaw, he like stabbed another guy in the armpit a couple times. This movie was bad. I didn't like it. Uh, Steven Seagal was only in the movie for 41 (laughs) minutes. Did you know that? Uh, I did not. Uh, Once we get that redone with Archer, I'm going to be really happy about that. Uh, So do you want to go to characters? I mean, everybody. Gary Busey, why is he dressed in drag? What was the purpose of that? I don't know what that was. I don't like how he spit in the booyah base. And when he was on the sub, no. he was getting so mad at the Italian people. He yells at him, why don't you speak English? The Italian <laughs> guy who he was yelling at that was trying to fix the side of the sub. Of course, his name was Luigi because we don't <laughs> care about anything and we just do what we want. I just, I didn't like him at all. He was a huge jerk. I love Gary Busey, but he was he was not good in this. His character was bad. He was bad. I'm just assuming that the direction was really bad. It was like, everyone go 125% on this one and be be really, really stupid. And it's going to look great. Yeah. And they're like, whatever. And then it makes a pile of money, and they probably all high-fived. Yeah, they definitely all high-fived and rubbed each other's ears. Dude, and then Gary Busey fixes the nuclear submarine with a freaking crowbar? Is that how submarines work? I don't thought. No, he needed a crowbar, a blowtorch, and an acetylene torch. And an acetylene torch. I'm like, dude, it's not a tractor. It's a nuclear submarine. Luigi didn't know what he was doing. Dude doesn't even speak English. Doesn't even speak English. The nerve. The three I had were Seagal and Great Value Nick Nolte and then the chick. Yeah. Not that I don't want to pass the uh, Breaker Breaker 1-9 test. I don't know. I didn't need her in there. I don't think she did a bad job as an actress. I just thought it was a stupid part that served no role except like, let's put some tits on the screen and then like have someone that Seagal can like be creepy towards. I didn't hate the actress. I hated the character. Yeah. And uh, Seagal, I hated him, um, and also the character um, and the performance. But the other two, I just didn't like the performances. Correct. Yes, that's that's well said. Um, political incorrectness. There was uh, great value. Nick Nolte it was dropping some homophobic uh, insults and some jokes early on in the movie. Yes. I didn't really catch any after that. Just those first couple. That's all. That's all I had. What we used to call worst CGI. I think let's just call worst effects because we're mentioning a lot of stuff that's not, not CGI, CGI, like you're talking about. Like, not stuff. So let's just do effects. You, you got some bad effects. I don't even care, honestly. This movie's so bad, I don't care about the effects. I just didn't like how the sub blew up twice. I, I, I enjoyed when they showed, like, them walking on the on the battleship deck. Now that I know that it's in Mobile and they're blocking out the thing, that's even cooler. I thought that part yeah. looked all right. Just something about, like, the angle that they filmed it on or something. It just didn't look, it looked shitty, and I didn't like it, and they could have <laughs> fixed it. Uh, I don't know how to fix it. Yeah, same. I mean, you know, there's there's a bunch of stuff that blows up, but it all blows up practically. None of it's CGI. Right. And it, I mean, the helicopter blows up, and I guess somehow, like, it blows up and it goes over the side of the boat. It didn't really make sense, but it, no, it's it was still burning on the top. Okay, it was burning on the top. Steven Seagal did also wrap a rope around his waist and jump off the side, so he probably has a broken back. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like, yeah, like he. Well, he didn't He didn't even, like, tie the rope to anything. He just he was like, oh, shit, there's a rope here. I guess I'll just grab this and jump over the side like Die Hard. Yeah. And then he, like, bangs on the side of the boat, and everyone's looking for him. Like, 25 guys are looking for him, and no one thinks to go look over the side, the, yeah. like, where, right where he was standing. No, they're just looking out into the water. Yeah, they're like, I don't know. I guess he disappeared. He's, he's an ninja. He's gone. Yeah. Uh, old tech, I mean, there's a lot of it. I liked how the bridge of the boat kind of looked like uh, – like the Rebel Alliance on Hoth, yes. like all the screens where you could see through and stuff. Yeah, they're like see-through screens with the radar and the light light pins. Uh, and all the buttons look like old, like, X-Wing buttons. They're like big ka-chunk, like, buttons that, like, light up when you yeah, press them. Yeah, totally. Uh, and also, he put together a sat phone from random stuff in a lifeboat. And she goes, oh, so it's like a car phone? I like that, because I remember car phones. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote down literally the phrase, like a car phone. That's literally how, that's how I wrote it, too, like a car phone. Yeah, and it had, like a, it had like, a, um, like a little tiny like umbrella that you would like unwrap. Yeah. That was like the- Not the car phone. Radar dish. No, no, his, his special phone that he talked to the Joint Chiefs of Staff with. I don't know how. 
he had that number, but that's who he talked to. He memorized the number. And then one of the one of the people in the Joint Chiefs of Staff was like, oh, yeah, Casey Ryback. I know him. He's great. <laughs> and like, you know the cook? That's the guy. You're, you guys are tight. You're the freaking <laughs> five-star admiral at the Joint Chiefs. Like, yeah, Ryback cook. He's awesome. He's got a great booyah base. Doesn't make enough pies, though, when you're trying to eat. <laughs> And the lady that walks in, she's like, yes, I have his file right here. I'm like, what? <laughs> Where did she get that? That's a physical paper file. That's what I'm saying, man. It's a perfect Archer episode. Just a terrible movie. That, I don't I don't have any other worst. Do you? The worst that I have here is like, I want to read some worst, like actual Steven Seagal real stuff that's happened. Oh, no. I'm just going to go. He, he has, there's a whole section of his Wikipedia that's titled Allegations and Lawsuits. Oh, my goodness. I'm just going to quickly move through some of this stuff. So let's see. Early 90s, three people accused Seagal of sexual harassment. Um, each of them got a $50,000 settlement. No, sorry, four people. Jenny McCarthy claimed that Seagal asked her to undress during an audition for Under Siege 2. Nice. In 95, he's charged with employment discrimination, sexual harassment, and breach of contract. A woman accuses him of threatening and beating her during the filming of On Deadly Ground. Um, 2010, a lawsuit's filed against him requesting a million dollars in damages, um, alleging sexual harassment, illegal trafficking of females for sex, failure to prevent sexual harassment, wrongful termination. 2011, someone filed a lawsuit over over his part in a p- police raid from his show, the show where he was like Steven Seagal, lawman. In Louisiana? No, no. The first season was in Louisiana. The second season was in uh, Maricopa County, Arizona. But Steven Seagal drove a tank through the guy's house and then killed his puppy and then a uh, hundred chickens. And the reason was because apparently the guy was was accused of doing cockfighting. And on suspicion of cockfighting, Steven Seagal drove a tank into his house and killed his puppy and a hundred chickens. And the quote from Steven Seagal in the episode was, animal abuse is a real pet peeve of mine. <laughs> In 2017, Portia de Rossi accused Steven Seagal of sexually harassing her during a movie audition. Dutch model Faviola Dadis posted a statement on her Instagram stating she'd also been sexually assaulted by Steven Seagal years earlier in 2018. Actress Rachel Grant publicly accused Steven Seagal of sexually assaulting her. 2018, another woman publicly claimed that in 93, Steven Seagal raped her at his home. Dude, how does- and then in 2020, uh, he got... He got penalized by the Securities and Exchange Commission for failing to disclose payments he received for promoting an investment in a crypto coin. Who's buying crypto coins because Steven Seagal says to? I don't know. He's he's He hawks a lot of stuff. People that are still wearing their class ring and yelling at people on Facebook? Those are the people. Uh, but anyway, the like sexual assault, sexual abuse, rape, sex trafficking lawsuits, they go from the late 80s up until like two years ago. And there are d- dozens have you seen what he looks like, though? Like, how? Do you, who says, yes, I'll get in a car with that guy? Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the attraction is all. I, I, I can't imagine that there is any. Five questions. Is, is it okay for kids? Uh, what age and why? No, it's not okay for anyone. No one, no one should watch this. Uh, there's a little bit of nudity, tons of violence, some language. Uh, I was saying 12 or 13. Yeah, I just, like, no one should be exposed to Steven Seagal at any age. Agreed. Would this movie get made if it were pitched now? It's a reboot has been pitched and is currently in development with HBO for HBO Max. Well, I wrote down, I hope not. Sorry, friend, it's happening. Uh, and in, like, 2053, we can we can review the reboot. Is it a movie or a TV show? Movie. Movie and movie. All right, if we remake it, who plays the lead? Do you have anybody? Do you know who the lead is for the new one? No, it's, it hasn't been cast. It's still in pre-production. Yeah, I, dude, I, I don't know. I, you know how I'm trying to be more diverse. We yeah. try to pick somebody else. Who's the guy that's the new Blade? I don't know. I don't know who that Mahashala is. Mahashala Ali or something like that. I don't know how to say his name, and I couldn't remember how to spell it. Yeah, I like that. I like that guy because he's like kind of tall and skinny, and he's lanky, and I I like the way he acts. I was trying to think, like, who's the most un person I could put in this role? And I didn't spend a lot of time with it either, but uh, I had Timothy Chalamet. Nice. That's a good choice. Kind of like a, like a floppy haired, like skinny, like, but he's a good actor. And he's also like in Dune, like he's totally kicking some ass. He is way better than this movie. Yeah. Maybe he'll be in the new one. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, the only other one I put was uh, to replace Gary Busey. I picked Nick Nolte. That's a good call. What? Who else do you pick? Can you still watch this movie and enjoy it in 2021? In my notes, if, as the answer to that question, I just wrote, LOL. I put no way <laughs> as my answer. <laughs> I just wish, I wish that I didn't, well, first of all, I wish that Stephen Skull was not a reprehensible human being who's an embarrassment. But if he's going to be, 
that douchiest douche who ever douched. I wish that I didn't know it because if I didn't know it, I might be able to enjoy this movie. But I do know it. You sound like Kat. She just says, I wish I could go back to not knowing stuff. I mean, I want to know stuff. I'm glad that I know stuff. There are times where it's like, man, I probably would like this movie if I didn't know that. That's the stuff she's talking about. She's like, I probably could have enjoyed it if I would have known that he's not uh, a rapist that wears yellow glasses all the time. Where can you find it? It's on Netflix. You should get a Netflix account just to watch this. <laughs> yeah, sign up for Netflix just to watch this. Oh, man, this thing's really throwing me off. I don't even know how to... I feel weird even asking anybody to subscribe or rate or review us after this podcast. I'm kind of ashamed. Yeah, me too. If you want to chat with us and other people about the podcast and about these movies, we started a Discord. Um, If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. And if you do know what that is, you can go to our website, click on the Discord, and come join us and chat about the movies. Tell us movies you want us to do for 92. Tell us how you really liked Under Siege and we missed a lot of the key points of it. (laughs) Whatever you want. We don't know that much about Discord, but we're trying to figure out a way to chat with people who like the movies and who like the podcast. And this seems like the best idea we've come up with. Um, So if you're down with that, feel free to come join us. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, right on. Subscribe, rate, and review. Next episode, Wayne's World, which will come out on the 30th anniversary of the release of the movie. So we'll we'll take it back up a notch. Nice. I'm going to go get my pies out of the oven. Thanks for listening to Movie Life Crisis. Please subscribe, rate, and review. And remember, don't drive angry.